All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. <coughs> Father, this congregation gathers together today and comes before the throne room. Holy Spirit, that you might teach us and that you might give us a measure of comfort. Everyone in this room has suffered and is suffering and will suffer. Everyone in this room has been comforted by you, I hope, and if they haven't, then I encourage them to listen ever so closely because that comfort is right here waiting for you. Lord, I pray that you give us a spirit of wisdom to understand and a heart to minister to apply this lesson not just to ourselves but to those around us. As you're demonstrating in your storms in the Carolinas, hurt and suffering can come from many different places. Lord, but comfort comes from you. I praise your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, the obvious low-hanging fruit of this scripture is comfort, and we will be talking about that. That's obviously one of the main points of this passage. But I think that if we were to understand this more fully, we could break it up into pieces. Um, before you can have comfort, you're going to need something. And that's affliction. It's not mentioned as many times as, afflic as comfort, but it is mentioned. Verse 4, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in affliction. Verse 5, for we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings. The promise here is comfort, but that promise is connected, intimately connected with the second promise, or rather the first promise. The first promise is suffering. Any so-called teacher who comes to you with a gospel, a so-called gospel that says, once you follow this teaching, you will not experience suffering, is preaching a false gospel and is a false teacher. And it's that simple. So we're going to talk about affliction and then we're going to talk about comfort. And there's a third part. So that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. Verse 6, if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort. There's a ministry issue here as well. It's not just for our comfort that God is here. It's so that we may be comforted. Why? So that we can go and comfort others. In fact, that, that phrasing in verse 4, who comforts us in all of our affliction to the purpose that we may be able to comfort those. He's not comforting you just for your sake. It is for your sake, but it's not just for your sake. So again, a Christianity that has us just sitting down and receiving is not a living faith. This is something that, that turns that blessing outward. And in fact, you will never get the full measure of God's blessing or the full measure of his comfort unless you uncork both ends. You've got to receive it from him, but then you've got to send it out. And then the comfort of the Lord passes through you. My wife's laughing at me. You're talking about uncorking both ends, please. <laughs> but it was not a, not a perhaps happy metaphor. So we're going to start with part one which is affliction. And this has come up many times over the past year. And in fact, it came up most recently in this body at the mentorship panel where um, a very good question was raised about uh, suffering and evil and so forth. And this is the foundational question that every worldview has to, has to uh, answer. If there is a loving and benevolent God who's all-powerful and all-loving, then when's evil? Where did evil come from? Is he not loving enough to keep evil from happening? Or is he loving enough but not powerful enough to stop it? Are either of those answers acceptable? Well, no, to Christianity, they're not acceptable. He is both all-loving and all-powerful. Well then, why evil? The persistence of this question, the power of this question to create atheists or to break believers, to drive people far from the arms of God or to drive people into the arms of God, the power of suffering in a spiritual sense 
is so profound and it has resisted easy explanation for many people. And that is because it doesn't have an easy explanation. It's that simple. It's complicated. It's that simple. It's complicated. In fact, it's so complicated I had to make a chart. So if you go ahead and fire that up for me, Kirk. You cannot expect an easy explanation for a complicated issue. So we're going to walk through this. Please bear with me. This is kind of... This might be a little college level for this first part, all right? This is our chart. In order to truly understand evil and suffering, we need to understand the different ways that it can manifest. I'm going to move this so that we don't have disaster. The purpose of this chart, the purpose of this part of the teaching is twofold. One, so you can understand it yourself and answer own questions that may have been lingering inside your own mind. All right, this is first for, your, for you. And then secondly, it is for ministration. It is so that you can understand what troubles beset your loved ones, the people you care about, the people you come in contact with, and you can understand what medicine might be most appropriate. Uh, we're going to get to the medicine part too. That's Christ's comfort. But first we need to understand because not all of these problems are the same problem. That's why calling it the problem of evil or the problem of suffering is complicated because there are multiple different problems. Number one, the first question we have to answer before we go any farther, can you guys see over there? Am I blocking the way? Is the difference between emotional and intellectual. And I need to address this first for y'all while you're sitting here because I'm going to be going through some information. But if you are dealing, and I know you are, because you are dealing with personal suffering, I don't want you to think for an instant that this is going to be comforting right here. It's not going to be. Because if you have an emotional issue of evil, if, you're, if you have suffered a loss or great pain, having answers isn't necessarily what you need in the moment. You need affection and you need compassion and you need love. It's far better in circumstances like that to just come alongside and hug and not even say a thing. And that addresses that particular problem of evil, if that makes sense, in that moment. Explanations are helpful in the future and information and understanding are all very helpful. But in the moment of deep grief, answers, theories, explanations are worse than useless. They hurt. Does that make sense? So before you even open your mind to this, especially in yourself sitting there and listening and receptive, because if you have a problem of suffering right now that is emotional right now, you might want to reject everything I'm about to say just because it's not helping you. Keep in mind, that's because it's going to be an emotional issue and none of this other really applies until that is salved and balmed enough to be somewhat calmed. Later on, you're going to want to have these answers as well. So just keep that in mind, okay? If it's emotional, hugs are great. If they're intellectual, hugs don't answer anything. It's like, I have this deep personal question. Well, let me give you a hug. Thanks, that was really nice. <laughs> I appreciate that. Question remains. All right. So you've got to figure out what you're dealing with or what this person is dealing with. Is it an emotional issue or is it an intellectual issue? You guys comfortable with that? Does that make sense? You've, I don't need to belabor that anymore. I'm going to kind of skim this as much as I can. It's, it's super complicated. I can spend years teaching on this alone. So if you have further questions, please, for anything, come and talk later. Next, what is the purpose of the solution that you're either looking for yourself or that somebody else is looking for? Okay, if it's ministry, because like emotional, right, you're going to minister to this person, then you don't need a bunch of answers. You don't need a bunch of theories. You just need to minister. Think about why you're here. What are you doing with this information? Now, this is interesting. Defense versus explanation. If I, as, a, as an evangelist, am out talking to a group of people and somebody comes up and he's an atheist and he wants to destroy my worldview to bring people over to his side for whatever reason, then he's going to make an attack. He's going to make an attack on Christianity. And these attacks need to be answered. It depends on the circumstances. If it's just me and him, I don't need to answer it. But if there's an audience who might be damaged by his attack, if, I, if it goes unresponded to, a response is needed. I don't need to give an explanation for Christianity. That's the worst possible time to give an explanation. I don't need to. He says, oh, God can't exist because evil, man. Babies are dying in Africa, and you know, there's a parasite that eats babies' eyes and cancer, and how could God possibly let that? All I need to do is give an explanation for why it's possible that God could allow that. And the burden of proof is on him to prove that God doesn't exist. Think about why you're here. He's not looking for answers. That's the key. So if you give him answers, it's pearls before swine. He will step on them. It'll be a long, drawn-out conversation about nothing. It will bless no one. But you flip it back and say, well, how do you know that this is the best possible world with free choice and that that person was exactly blessed by it? How do you know that in 100 years that's not going to reap thousands of souls to heaven? Please tell me how you know that. Defense made. Game over. That was the reason you were here. 
it was an intellectual but also an emotional issue because that atheist probably was hurt in his past, but now he's using intellectual attack to cover his emotional wounds, and as a result, you just gave a defense. Right? You have to understand, this, is, this requires precision. That's why this, that's why this resists an easy answer. There is no easy answer. It requires subtlety. It requires discernment in the spirit. It requires deep compassion. It requires patience and listening, and it requires admitting that we don't have the answers. At the end of this, the answer is going to be, I don't know. I'm going to give you a spoiler alert, okay? In the end of this, for your particular, your particular suffering, the answer is going to be, I don't know. There could be a variety of answers that go into it, and there probably are a variety of answers that go into it, but the ultimate why is going to be, I don't know. Just know that. Be comfortable with that. This is an area where faith is required. But understanding is also provided, okay? So, are you giving an explanation? That removes obstacles. I haven't... Can you explain to me how a God could allow this? Well, I can give you some, some possible explanations for that. That's really helpful. Blind faith is, is a detriment to Christianity. So many people have been raised in a Christian church thinking, well, it's God's will. It's God's will, which is a shorthand, which, yes, it is God's will, but what that means in that context is we'll never know, and maybe there's a God, maybe there's not. Please stop asking questions and thinking about it. It's just going to hurt everyone's feelings. That's helpful for nobody. Why are some possible reasons that my grandmother could have died when I was 10 in such a horrible way with cancer? Why are some possible reasons that my wife could have gotten cancer? Can we think of any possible explanation that God could have allowed this? Well, yeah, I can think of a whole bunch of them, and I can share them with people. So, and when you, in your suffering, can explain to others how Christ comforted you and how he explained some things to you, that's some pretty potent comfort that you can give out, isn't it? You're not just saying, well, I'll be praying for you, brother. God willed it. It's... Here's what God did in my life. Here's some of the answers he gave me, but he didn't give me all of them, and maybe some of these will help you, and I'm here for you. That's a way better answer. But you're not going to be able to deliver it unless you can think precisely about this. Next, level of application. And by the way, since I'm doing this kind of like a college class, this first part, feel free if you, if you want something explained a little bit more to raise your hand. We don't normally do that, but for this particular section, that's appropriate. Anything so far? Y'all with me? Okay, good. Uh, if you see your neighbor nodding, slap them on the back of the head. All right, level of application, personal versus conceptual. If I want to know why cancer exists, that's a whole lot different than I want to know my wife has cancer. You follow me? Completely different set of answers required. Completely different way of thinking about this. It seems like it's the same thing, cancer and cancer. Completely different. Why could God in general allow such a thing as cancer to exist? Why did God ask my wife to endure cancer? Completely different. You need to understand what it is that you're asking of God and what this person is asking of you. Personal and ministerial applications. Next, what type of evil are we talking about? Moral and natural. Somebody coming and murdering your child is a whole lot different than your child being swept away by floodwaters. But here's the thing. We're talking about evil. Evil implies a moral duty. If a rock falls down a mountain and lands in a river, there's no evil that's been conducted. The rock has fallen, there's been some disorder, but no evil has been conducted. If a rock falls and hits your child on the head off that same mountain and kills him, you feel an evil has been done. Why did who take your child? God. God is the moral agent in this case. Right? If you can't find a human to blame, there's only one person with choice left. The one who's the author of all of creation. The one who has the power to take life or give it. All right? And it is very natural... In a, in a person's mind to assign blame or responsibility to God. And to a certain extent, blame is not appropriate, but responsibility certainly is in, this, in, in many senses. Um, and we'll get, again, no blanket explanations cover this. You have to be precise. So was this a natural event like the hurricane or did somebody do something? I'll pause right here and make a little interjection. This goes into the concept of free will versus God's sovereignty. All right, did God create a world where we have free will? It's pretty apparent that we, he did. We can choose to do things. If, if God created a world where we had no choice but to obey his laws and be good, is that actually choice? If he created a world of free choice where there's no choice, that's contradictory. If you create a world of free choice, then by some definition, some people are going to choose evil. So God had two options. Well, I guess three. Don't create us at all. Okay. Or if he's going to create us because he wants someone to love, then create robots who we can love, who can do nothing but obey him and dance awesomely. <laughs> <laughs> or create people who have the free choice and say, yes, Abba, Father, I love you, which means some of them are going to say, nope, I got this. I'm going to do this on my own. 
Can you say for sure that God did not create the best possible world with the maximum number of people who are going to choose him? You need to have the certain amount of people to say no. This is the perfect ratio. That would be my supposition. This is the perfect ratio. God who knows the end from the beginning has allowed a world of free choice because he loves you. He wants to give you the free choice to choose your own lives. And as a result, some of you in the past have not. And some of you are here today. Well, you're all here today. And that's a good thing. But then how do we explain this? We can understand moral evil a lot easier. This guy, God gave free choice to and he chose evil. Okay. But my kid got cancer. Nobody did anything wrong. There's no one to blame here except God. So we need to understand what type of evil we're coming to in order to understand what kind of application. It doesn't do any good to say, well, you know, people have free choice and so God killed your son with a rock falling off the mountain. So God has free choice to do evil? Is, is that evil when God does it? These are subtle. These are subtle issues. And then responsible party. Was it somebody else or was it yourself? Now give me an example of how these two connect. Let's say that a rock falls off the mountain and it hits your son. Okay. Now let's say that 10 years ago you had built your house under the mountain where rocks always fall and you had been warned specifically that rocks fall and your son's out playing and a rock falls on his head. Now was that God's doing or was that yours? Discernment, precision is needed. Okay. You guys got this? Different pieces. They can get mixed and matched. Okay, so let's say somebody comes to you and they've got an intellectual problem. They, they want some questions answered, but it's, they need an actual explanation. They're not looking for a defense. They want answers. But it's about cancer in general, or it's about murderers, like serial killers, uh, moral evil um, that they are committed by others against people. You see how you can just mix and match these? That specific, that's their specific problem of evil. It has many different components. And you can't, there is no blanket answer. You need to listen to each individual case of suffering. And frankly, they overlap. All right, that young man who was playing in the garden uh, and got hit by a rock, okay, well, yeah, maybe they shouldn't have built that house there, but that rock could have landed somewhere else. God allowed that rock to land on the kid's head. So there's still a couple of different issues there. Also, that kid didn't do anything wrong. Why not hit me with the rock, right? These are questions that are legitimate. You can't just brush those under the rug and say, well, God wills it. God did will it. And that brings us to God's will. All right? We can break this down a little bit. God's sovereign will versus God's revealed will. This is God's revealed will when he tells you specifically what he wants you to do. He's telling you what his will is. It's also called um, like rules, all right? his declarative will. He's declaring to you what he wants you to do. All right. But then there's what happens in our life. Okay, well, my wife got cancer. I'm using, and for those of you who don't know, my wife did just have cancer, and she's in remission now, so I'm not using it as a random example. That's actually a case. So we understand this. Um, did God will that to happen? If you answered no to that, what that means is that the universe or the enemy or us were able to do a thing that God literally couldn't prevent. He didn't want that to happen, but we made it, and we beat God. All right, well, that can't be right. Did God desire for that to happen? All right, here's where the language gets tricky. You have to be precise. God can both make something happen himself. It's called his efficacious will, where he, you know, changes water into wine. He creates you. He creates the universe. This is him exercising his will, allowing his will to come forth, forth and, and create something in the universe. Then he created us, free people. I can go and kill someone, he didn't desire me to do that, but he did desire to allow me the freedom to do that. Subtle distinction, but incredibly important for understanding. He desired to give me the freedom, knowing that I would do this thing. This is a hard thing to swallow. This is a hard teaching. Knowing that I would do this thing. Okay, but we don't have all the answers. How many thousands of people will be saved to Christ because of that murder, including the child who was murdered goes to, goes to heaven? What is the end result of my action? We don't know that. We just literally do not have any of the pieces necessary to formulate a coherent picture of what this result is. We don't like it. We know that immediately. But we don't know what God is doing or what benefit this has or what the effects are. We don't know what evil was suppressed and what good was brought. Is it possible that that child who was brutally murdered is now in heaven because he was killed as a child, but if he had been allowed to live, he would have brutally murdered others for other reasons and would have gone to hell along with many other people, and that by taking that child's life now when it was demanded of him, he was skipped all of this painful life and got entered into heaven while at the same time others were saved as well? Is that possible? If it's even possible, then we can't say that it couldn't be because we don't know. 
So God desires us to do things as revealed in his will, and he wishes that we would, but he will also desire us to give us the freedom because that's part of his plan, and in his sovereign will, he allows it. And then sometimes he reaches in and says, no, we're doing this right now, and he makes it happen. I'll give you an example of that. He gave Saul free will to go and persecute Christians, but then he exercised his uh, efficacious will by blowing him off his donkey and blinding him. So he gave him freedom, and he could have still had his freedom after that point. He did still have his freedom after that point, but God knew him well enough to know by me reaching into his life and knocking him sideways, that's going to get him on the right path because I love him and I love everyone else. In order to understand the suffering you or somebody else is going through, you need to understand what that suffering is, who's delivering it, and what some of the reasons may be. Okay, you can go ahead and turn that off. Thank you for your patience. That's the last chart I have, I promise. All right, so you can understand how complicated the issue of suffering alone must be. This explains, um, when we get into the, the area of comfort, why the Holy Spirit has so many names. The Holy Spirit has a lot of different names and or job titles, depending on how you want to look at this. All right, the first and the most applic obviously applicable here one is paracletus. Paracletus, I like that. Uh, which is translated alternatively as comforter, counselor, or advocate. Okay? It's different places above the scripture, different, different verses, is translated as comforter, counselor, or advocate, but it's the same word. But think about how different that is. If I, am, if I just suffered a loss, someone coming and comforting me is exactly what I need. If I'm being sued, then somebody giving me a hug is nice, but having a lawyer come who knows the best law and can get me out of this jam and go advocate for me, that's a whole lot more comforting, isn't it? If you get offered, like, okay, you can have one of these others. All right, I know you're getting sued for $10,000. Um, you can have a hug or you can have the world's best civil attorney. Which do you want? Right? There's nothing wrong in picking the advocate or the counselor. Okay, good advice. I don't know which way to go. Well, here's a hug. Yay, I like hugs. I still don't know which way to go. All right? <laughs> Counselors are appropriate. <laughs> I'm knocking on hugs. I like hugs, I promise you. It's not always appropriate. Hector. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw that yeah, I know you did. That's why it was fair game, and I knew you wouldn't be offended. All right, what else? Author of scripture. Is there anything more comforting than opening your word to your daily Bible reading and seeing that verse that reaches into your pain and is like the God of the universe has noticed you and sees you and says, I love you. Here's this special word for you. And that he's been doing that for... 4,000, 5,000 years? Astonishing. Astonishing. You can read that same verse over and over again. It's, it's meaningful. It's not, it's not meaningless. But it's not, you know, it's not personal until all of a sudden it's the most personal thing you've ever experienced. He's a counselor in this form. It's amazing. All right, what else do we got? Convictor of sin. Oh, that's really comforting not to be convicted of sin. <laughs> All right, raise your hand. How many of you have been a fugitive from justice? Just, just, just me? Oh, all right. Okay, no. <laughs> not. <laughs> there is very little as stressful as hiding a secret sin or being on the run in some way. Always wondering if you're about to get caught. Hiding it and running and ducking until finally you are confronted with it and it's almost a relief. The day that you feared is finally here. You've caught me. It's over. Thank you, Lord. All right, so there's that. That, that, is, that is strangely comforting. You're right. I did that. The burden is off. The burden is off. It's like a blackmailer. Just, you finally just admit the truth in public, and now he has no power over you. But there's another way. Think of it as a disease. The sin that you're holding inside of you is poison. It's killing you. And when the Holy Spirit convicts you of that, and because of that conviction you repent and have it removed, that is an immediate and present comfort. That's surgery. Okay? Diagnosis and surgery is comfortable, comforting, even if it's not comfortable. All right, next. He's called the deposit or the seal or the guarantee, also called like the earnest money. Basically, it is the proof. Frankly, it's the proof that Christianity is true right now. Every other worldview has to ask you to wait until you die to find out if it's Buddha or nobody or Ganesh or whatever. Christianity says, no, no, we're going to give you the Holy Spirit right now as a guarantee. 
So for those of us who have the Holy Spirit in us, you don't ever have to worry. You don't ever have to think, well, is God true? Hey, God, are you true? Yes, I'm true. Sweet. He's in you. <laughs> you, have a, you have a relationship with him constantly, or you should. And if you don't, you can. That's, that's, if you take nothing away from that today, if you don't have a relationship with him that moment by moment, day by day, that you can turn to him at every moment and feel his presence. This is key. Feel his presence. There's lots of different kinds of knowledge. I can tell you that Abraham Lincoln was the 16th president, and you can get lots of sources of information to back that up. You can reasonably believe that Abraham Lincoln is the 16th president, okay? I mean, it's possible you could be wrong, you, but you can say that you know it. But if you, are, if you are very, very cold, I could come to you and say, the room is actually warm, you must have the fever, and that may be true. But what you could not be wrong about, what you absolutely, without a doubt, cannot be wrong about is that you feel cold. No one can convince you that you don't feel cold. You might not actually be cold, but you actually feel cold. That is what's called incorrigible knowledge. You literally cannot be wrong about it. You possess it intimately. It's the knowledge of feeling. It's the knowledge of seeing. I am aware that I am seeing you right now. This is not a question of facts that I just believe. I am experiencing it right now. And that is the Holy Spirit inside you. That seal and that guarantee, you are experiencing the living God right now. That is not something that can be doubted. That is not something that can be effectively questioned. Now, the atheist or the person outside that you're telling about that, that's propositional knowledge to them. You're telling them, please believe me, this is true, and they can choose to believe you or not because they don't experience it directly. But you experience it directly or you should. And if you do, then there's no reason to doubt it. So that's a great comfort. That's an ever-present comfort. And then, you know, in that role, he's your guide. Again, how amazing is that? He's going to take you where you need to go. For those of us that were running our own life for a period of time, uh, trying to control every element of our lives. I was just having this conversation at the beginning with somebody. Control every element of our lives. Try to make ourselves happy. Trying to make these people do this. Trying to make this thing turn out this way. Trying to get my dream job. Trying to get college done. Trying to do this. Trying to do that. The burden is enormous. Why? Because we're trying to do God's job. We're trying to, we've decided this is going to make me happy. I don't know why we've decided that. Whatever it is. Oh, I'm pretty sure that's it. I learned it in a Disney movie. I'm going to go follow my heart over here. That's going to make me happy, that distant target. I'm going to take these steps now that are going to carry me through the future to that target. Okay, so that's like three levels of imaginary nonsense. One, you're imagining that you know what's going to make you happy in some distant future even though you've never experienced it before. All of a sudden you know. All right, false. Two, you know that you can get yourself to that place through a series of steps. You don't know how to get there. Three, you have the illusion that you can control any part of the future. Like I'm not only do I know how to get there, I can control all these variables in reality to get me there. Nonsense. But who can? How about the God who knows you better than you know yourself? How about the God who knows the end from the beginning? How about the God who actually controls all of reality and has hand-placed every single atom in the universe? You think that guy can handle it? When you turn your life over to him as a guide, that is a present comfort. You no longer need to worry about the future. You no longer need to worry about what you're going to say or what you're going to do or what you're going to eat or any of that. Indweller of believers is another name for him. I already mentioned that with the deposit and the seal and the guarantee. God is right there with you. Intercessor in prayer with wordless groans is like in Romans 8.26. He goes, he speaks for you in the, at the throne room of God when you just don't know what to say, when you just don't know how to pray. He does it for you. Christianity is amazing. It's incredibly hard in so many ways, but in other ways, it's incredibly easy. God wants you to be saved and he's willing to do all of the work. All he wants you to do is just come along for the ride in some, in some sense. And he's got work for you to do, but he's going to give you all the strength to do it and tell you what to do and tell you how to do it and kind of carry you through. So it's a pretty good gig. He's also called the revealer or the spirit of truth. This is key. Um, how, how, the fog of mystery in front of your life. Like, who is this person? Is this person good for me? What about this job? Is this good for me? What about, what should I be doing with my life? Haven't you just said, I just want to know. Even if it's bad news, I just want to know so I can know what I'm supposed to do next. This is what he does. He's also called the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord, and the Spirit of Christ. Through the Holy Spirit within you, it is the Spirit of God, the Father, and it is the Spirit of Christ, meaning you can know doctrinally that you can have relationships with all three of these people they're all God. They're all persons of the same essence, the Godhead. And although we can't understand that, you can still experience it. You can experience gravity without understanding what it's made out of. 
Okay? You don't have to fully understand something to experience and know that it's true. And you can experience interpersonal relationship with all three persons of the Godhead. It's called the spirit of life, spiritual sustenance, that emptiness that was inside of us for so long that we were looking everywhere to fill and could never, ever fill. That is what he gives you. you know, I, I no longer lie awake at night feeling the abyss of death opening up beneath my feet. I, nighttime is my most comfortable time. I feel his presence. He gives me that food that I'm always longing for. If you go, I take some guys out to Nashville, downtown Nashville on a Friday night every so often, just as an um, opportunity to observe the desperate people crawling like maggots on a corpse. It's trying to be grotesque, but that's exactly what it feels like once you get down there and start looking at it. Desperately hungry, biting and clawing at each other for some measure of life, ripping fresh wounds in each other and in themselves in the process as they drink poison and mingle with people they don't even know, strangers trying to hunt for what it is and they don't know and they're wounding themselves terribly. Well, what they're looking for is the spirit of life, to know that they're loved and to have that love inside them. And if you don't have that again, you can. Christianity is not just a religion of promises. It's a, it's a religion of deliverance. It delivers those promises right now, right now, in this room, at this moment. He's also called teacher. That's pretty straightforward with his very word, and then he reveals that word to you. Even without the word, he can reach you directly. He can teach you what it is that you need to know. He does it through prophets. He does it through priests. He does it through kings. He does it through each other, which is what you all are. You all are, some, you all are ministers, first to your own soul through the power of God, and then to the others. And witness. You, he is a witness to you about who God is, and who Christ is, and you become a witness to others through his power. So do you see how each of these names could be applied to the problem of suffering? If you need an explanation, well, he's a teacher. Right? If you need ministration, well, then he's, he's a comforter. Right? If you need to understand how your son was taken, uh, he's a revealer of truth. Uh, if, you need a, if you need assurance that your loved one is safe, well, he's that deposit and that seal and that guarantee in you. And since you know that that person was saved, you can have that sense. Uh, he's, he's, he's a convictor of sin, and so you can understand that that suffering could be a way for the Father to bring people to their knees and understand that he is Lord. And although you hate it for this person, that they're going through suffering, your family member, whoever, or God forbid yourself, perhaps this is an opportunity to realize that God is Lord and he's got you. This is why the Gideons put Bibles in the hands of military men and in the hotel rooms of America because those are some desperate places. Those are where people come to their last legs and their last breaths. And it's a fantastic ministry. Which leads me to the last section, which is the ministry portion. Some of you in this room today are called by God to do nothing more right now than sit and be ministered to. I've been there. My wife has been there. This is a blessed time. Take it. Soak it up. By all means, get your rest. He is a God of rest. He will lead you beside still waters, green pastures. He will make you lie down if you don't lie down. In my case, he broke my back. Lie down. Good boy but take it. Some of you are here to get that. Now, we're all here to get that constantly in some measure, but some of you are here today need that primarily. You're not being given a call to ministry right now. You're being given a call to allow God to minister to you. Just rest. Right? That is appropriate. To get up and try to do things for some obscure reason of block checking or trying to help others even though you're not fit for it. It's like a man with a broken leg trying to help his friend. He's not helping him and he's permanently damaging himself. If, it's, if you're called to sit, be honest about that. Flip that, though. There are people dying in the streets all around us, literally and spiritually. Uh, physically, I should say, because it's literal both ways. Physically and spiritually. They are drawing their last breath right now, or they are cursing their last curse to God before the Holy Spirit abandons them to that. Because sometimes he does that. He lets them go to Satan, and they no longer feel his pull. They no longer feel his conviction. That's a terrible place to be. I've been there. He can get you back, but it's a terrible place to be. There are people around you at work, at school, your neighbors. Who are they? Do you know their names? Do you know their stories? Have you looked them in the eye? If you are called to do more than just absorb the teaching, absorb the healing, absorb the comfort, if you are one of the ones sitting here that is actually supposed to be doing something else and you are not doing it, God says, their blood is on your hands. Why? Well, look at the problem of suffering. Look at the, the moral agent. If I walk by the road... Good Samaritan story, right? And you're bleeding, bleeding out on the side of the road. And I'm like, hey, man, I'll be praying for you. And I walk off. That's on me. I didn't beat him up. 
I abandoned them. That was my sin. Okay? Hey, there's my neighbor. Oh, man, he's an atheist, but that's a really awkward conversation. I don't really want to have it. I'd rather we'll watch Chippendales, Rescue Rangers. Pretty good show. No, it's not a good show. <laughs> also, go rescue your neighbor. Nobody knows that show. <laughs> <laughs> Flashback to the 80s. People, people are dying. People are really dying. And it doesn't take... If you have any doubts about this, drive through downtown Nashville on a Friday. Don't get out of your car if you don't feel comfortable. Look at them. What are they looking for? What do you think they're going to find? Remember your days, if, if you were ever in that place where you were looking for something. And what did you find? And when did they draw your last breath? When did they draw their last breath? When did they actually die and go face judgment? Do you know? Is it tonight? For millions of people, the answer is yes. Which ones are the ones that cross your path? The evilest people on earth, the cruelest people, most sadistic people on earth have also all suffered. I don't know how God's mercy and his judgment work. I don't know if there are some people who are destined from the beginning to go to hell and they'll never see God and they never experience God and they're like jars set aside, devoted to destruction. It clearly seems that way from scripture. It's a hard thing to swallow. I don't understand that. I'm not going to pretend to understand that. But I do know that I don't know which is which. I do know that if you would have come across me 10 years ago, you would have thought I was one of those jars destined for destruction and, and it had nothing in, the, in him worth being saved. And I would have agreed with you. I would have agreed with you. God knows the end from the beginning. He doesn't ask you to save anyone. He doesn't ask you to know who's worth saving. He asks you to listen to him closely. Be ministered by him tenderly. Be open to his leadings and his ministrations. Hear his voice. Turn your own sufferings over to him so he may comfort them so that when you are comforted and used to hearing his voice, he can tell you who needs his comfort now. And then you can deliver it. And it's never awkward. It is the most blessed, generous, wonderful experience. And it is frankly the most healing experience you will ever have. Nothing heals your wounds like the Spirit of God flowing through you to heal another's. It is the most restorative experience ever. I cannot recommend it enough because this eventually is what we're called to do. If you, can, if you can talk to people or move through space and you're a Christian, this is what you're called to do. Our church body is a collection of very wounded people. It always has been. We scrape ourselves in off the streets and collapse into the back row and just hang on for dear life. Sometimes we come, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we fall back into pits of despair. Wounded, wounded, wounded. Oh, I've made a good point. I'm not sure that our level of wounding is greater than any other church. We're just not afraid to show it. People have lost children, parents, friends. People have been raped, assaulted, stolen from, abandoned by parents, by friends, by churches. Physically, spiritually, emotionally wounded. And we've wounded ourselves with drugs and alcohol and promiscuous sex, and self-loathing, and body image issues. Tattered shreds of humanity, flesh flayed from the bones. Well, that's how Christ looked. We come in here, and we gather together, and this is what the church, not just these group of people in this building, but the church, the actual church is supposed to do. We bear with one another. We comfort one another. We are the earthly presence of the Holy Spirit who does ministrations for ourselves first. We accept God's healing. We, we, we feel God's healing. We know God's healing. We understand what's addressing. Which, which, which evil is it addressing? What, what, what are my hurts? Because we can cling on to them if we don't know. Surrender the hurts. And then when we are being healed, I promise you, God will bring you pretty much the next week somebody who's going through the exact same thing. I mean, Show of hands, how many people have ministered to somebody over something they just went through? I mean, yeah, that's how God works. He doesn't want you to be perfect. He's perfect. I mean, he does want you to be perfect, but he knows you're not. And he's actually, this is the process of sanctification, the continual healing of wounds. Sin is a mind state that says, you know what would be really great for me? Drinking poison until my brain breaks. Hey, you know what? Giving my whole heart and being to this person who I don't even know. That'll probably turn out well. Hey, you know what? Abandoning my family and working 60 hours a week is probably 70 hours a week, 80 hours a week. That's probably going to bring great fruit. They'll be really blessed by that. We are so broken in that state that we 
deliver wounds to everyone we know, and everyone delivers wounds to us. And this is why God views sin as a punishment worthy of death. If I say a harsh word to my kid or to a stranger, ah, hey, you jerk, get out of my way, I go off. Maybe that's the only sin I've ever committed in my entire life. A harsh word to somebody. Right. Does he immediately forget that word and it goes away and it has no effect? Or does it lodge in his heart like a stone? And then when he gets home, he's frustrated and he yells at his kid who grows up and that's still there and he yells at their kid. And, you know, echoes throughout centuries until thousands of cases of child abuse are impacted and aggravated by that one harsh word one man spoke 200 years ago. Can you say that doesn't happen? God says your sin is worthy of death. But somehow, in some way, he gives us the ability to comfort other people. And it's the most amazing thing. He redeems us. Christ redeems us. You are saved. You don't need to do a single thing to earn that. But he gives you an amazing opportunity to be the hands and the feet of the blessings to the people whom you formerly cursed. It, it feels redemptive. It feels like I'm making up for the past somehow. It's not quite right. But it's like the amount of wounds that I delivered, I can't fix those. But I've been forgiven of those. And now, because of the pain that I feel thinking about what I did, I can use that as fuel to help others and to bless others and to love others. And it feels good. I'm not getting anything back from y'all. I mean, that's not what I'm saying. That's not, that's not, I'm not in that for that. I'm not in this relationship for that. I don't need anything back from you. Why? Because I'm getting it wholly from him, completely from me. He's pouring through me. It is utterly transfiguring. And then I just, there's nowhere else for it to go but out. It, that's where it has to go. And then I get to see him touch you. That is a reward. There is a give and take that occurs. That is what happens. But I don't enter into this relationship <laughs> expecting that because there is nothing from you that I need in general sense, except when I do and then God tells you to and then you, you do it and there's a, there's a communion there that happens. But we cannot go to other humans. We cannot go to other things for that spiritual sustenance because that delivers more wounds. When you put in your body or in your mind something that doesn't belong, that's poisonous. You introduce a foreign thing into you as poisonous. And when you introduce something into you that is where God should be, that's deadly. So, in closing, look at your pains. Look at your suffering and those of your loved ones. Carefully, precisely, think about what they mean, what they are. Are they caused by you? Is this your responsibility? Are they caused by others? What's your, what's your responsibility in that sense? Are they caused by God? How do you feel towards him? Did he wrong you? Or does he have a plan that you're just not privy to yet? What is your relationship to yourself and to him and to other people in regards to your suffering? And then look around you. Who is suffering now? What is your call? Are you called to minister? Do you have explanations? Have you thought about any of this? Have you asked people what their suffering is? Are they just putting on a happy face? I guarantee you, everyone in this room is experiencing suffering right now of some kind, big or small. God is asking you to stand up or sit down. And in the cases of those who are called to sit down, you're probably standing up and running around and doing stuff. And he just wants you to sit down and listen and be ministered to. If you've been so busy because of the wounds of your heart, you don't want to think it and you don't want to feel it and you can't slow down because they'll catch up with you, stop. He's enough. If you've been sitting there and absorbing his healing and absorbing his word, feel really good about yourself and you're kind of getting to be a kind of a plump sheep, as they say, stand up. Go deliver that. Other people desperately need it. All right, and that's all I've got. Let's pray. Father, there is so much suffering in this world. Deep, horrible, painful suffering. And even the little stuff that we think, oh, compared to so-and-so who just got executed in Iraq, this is nothing. And yet, even these small wounds drive us either away from your arms or towards them. And that, are, that is an effect of powerful significance. Let us not take our suffering lightly. We don't understand, God, why you allowed so much suffering, but we do know that you entered into it, and that's astonishing. You gave up your throne and came to earth and bore suffering. By, our, by your stripes we are healed, and that is meaningful. Lord, we, may we enter into your suffering for the right reasons so we can experience your comfort 
so that we can then deliver your comfort to others as we share in their affliction. Heavenly Father, I pray a full measure of your Holy Spirit in all your jobs, Holy Spirit, in all your names, I pray it on these people that they might be first blessed by you and then be a blessing. Love God and love everybody else. In your name, Jesus.